so I assume everybody can hear me because Sam's responding back to me. Uh, if you can't, I've got the chat open here, so I'll keep an eye on that. Um, and I guess full disclosure before I start, uh, I am insanely nervous. Uh, I considered this a chat among my peers, and then uh, I noticed all the people that are, are on here are people that I look up to, so um, bear with me if I've got the jitters. Um, obviously, I'm going to be talking about hidden in plain sight, disclosing information via your APIs. Um, a couple of different things that we're going to cover there. But before I get started, I just wanted to give a big thanks to, to Sam and, and Haddix for throwing this out. Um, Jason, uh, before I was uh, putting this together, uh, Jason had reached out to me and, and thought it might be good for uh, a good opportunity to make a presentation. And I didn't really think I had a topic to, uh, to work through, but uh, in the chat, uh, we came up with something, or rather, he he kind of encouraged me to do it. So uh, so thank you for that. Um, there's also been uh, a ton of information that he shared with me in my interview with him. If you haven't seen that, I would encourage that as well when he sat down and chatted with uh, Zed Shana with me uh, for hacking pro tips uh, as well. So uh, in terms of who I am, uh, Pete Jaworski uh, at Jaworsk, pretty much everywhere. Uh, I'm now part of the application security team over at uh, Shopify. Uh, and that's largely because of uh, bug bounties. Um, really, if it weren't for bug bounties, I wouldn't be there. So uh, Casey was talking about that earlier. Um, I'm definitely one of those stories, and I'd be happy to chat uh, with anybody about that if they're curious how that came to be. Uh, I've also written a book, Web Hacking 101, which uh, hopefully in the new year will be real world web hacking via no starch in print. Uh, I don't know when it'll be released, but pre-sales are up now. Uh, and I'm obviously also a bug bounty participant. Uh, so in terms of what I'm going to cover with you guys um, or girls, uh, what we're going to talk about, so I'm going to kind of lay that out so we got some groundwork. Um, I'm going to talk about why we care about disclosing information, um, but I'm going to take a bit of a different track than others have, and I'm going to kind of go through why it happens. Uh, I feel it's important to understand kind of the, the mistakes that developers can make because once you can get into that mindset, um, you can open the door to some some great vulnerabilities that I think people without uh, developer experience might miss. Uh, so my goal, hopefully one of the takeaways, is to give you insight into that uh, and give you a framework to, uh, um, to continue on. Um, I'm going to talk about how you find these types of vulnerabilities. So that's hand in hand, kind of uh, going off of why it happens. And then I'll share some examples um, from bounties that I've had. Um, I've chosen three, but I probably could have listed upwards of, I don't know, 10 or 15 or so. And of course, my slide doesn't want to go. Um, so in terms of what we're talking about, I'm talking about APIs that are disclosing personally identifying information or application sensitive information, right? So this is something that could be leveraged by an attacker. Um, to attack the application itself or its users. Um, what I'm not talking about is headers that just say, you know, you're using Nginx version 2.1 or whatever the versions are, or PHP version, this or that. Um, we're going to talk about APIs uh, which render information on the page, um, as well as APIs themselves that are used by mobile applications. Um, but really, it's the, the APIs that are rendering this type of information on page that I find to be overlooked quite often. And it's I assume it's because you'll see it in this massive HTML page. So there will be a ton of HTML. And then down at the bottom, you might see this JSON encoded um, blurb. That's all the data that's being used on the page. Uh, and the tip off for that is when you're seeing frameworks like React or, or Angular or whatnot. Um, and you can see some of the calls that are, are having API information there. In terms of why we care, I mean, really these are, and the reason why I debated presenting this was because it almost seems so easy to find these. Um, and I know, at least I hear that a lot, kind of when I was learning, um, this is easy, that's easy, but um, it, it's really just opening your eyes to looking at HTML source, looking at APIs. And then one of the things uh, when I had an interview with, with Franz was him talking about, um, looking at the information that's being disclosed by something and then figuring out how that could be sensitive to a company. And that was a huge takeaway for me because I started changing my perspective on applications that I was hacking on. I was looking for information of if they disclose this, do they actually care that they disclose that? Um, so that's why I consider this to be easy. The impacts really range. Um, like you can have something that's, you know, you might be disclosing something that the company doesn't really care too much about, but you can also be disclosing some critical information. And I'll show you that um, in one of the examples we talk about where I found uh, on page in the HTML source, um, users, IP addresses, uh, birthdays, um, 
hash passwords, the salt for their hash password, um, a whole bunch of information, and you'll see it as one of the examples. Um, and really, it was because I looked at the HTML source for the page, uh, and there was a pattern on this application, and it seemed like they had a lot of technical debt, uh, where this was a, a design pattern that they had used, um, and I'll, I'll try to explain why I think it happened. And then lastly, um, sometimes these information uh, disclosures can be chained together. Um, and so I, I recently had one that I reported earlier uh, earlier this week, a couple of days ago, where it was exactly that. And if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about that because it's not part of the uh, the examples. But these are the types of messaging that I tend to to look for. Um, so here you'll see, you know, your address won't be shared with anyone. That's a red flag for me because if I can find the address, that's obviously going to be a problem for the application. Um, this is one from the examples. The customer ID is 26 characters long. You'll never guess that. Well, if you leak it, I don't have to guess it. Um, you know, we won't show your postal code. Regular users can only see other users. Um, and we use this data for analysis. We'll never share it. Again, it all kind of stands out. In terms of why this happens, I really think it boils down to two things. I was going to put a third, but I didn't want to be uh, an ass, for lack of a better term. Um, it's really an automation of repetitive tasks, um, and I'll show you that, and then code abstraction. The third one I was going to say was laziness or stupidity, but I mean, I, I think when you're moving quickly, um, uh, some of these sites are, are building things out pretty quick. Um, you know, they're competitive. They want to have product to market right away. Um, so when you're looking at automating repetitive tasks and kind of abstracting the code, it's easy to make mistakes and incur that technical debt, and that's where we come in to kind of help out the company to, to fix that. So I'm using a, a Rails example here, um, and I'm going to talk about the automation side of things. Um, so when you're working with Rails and you're developing an application, um, you're going to end up going through this, this design pattern at the beginning, uh, because Rails is what's referred to as a model view uh, controller architecture, so MVC. So the idea being that all three of these layers are separate. So you'll send a request to a website, and um, the controller will receive that request, right? It'll be, you know, come in through the application and it'll know the, the root or the URL that you're looking for. It'll go to the controller and that controller is responsible for taking the parameters and then touching the database and getting the information. So that's the model layer, right? The model um, interacts with your database and then gives the information back to the controller. Now the controller is going to pass that information into the view that's going to render it for you and that's where you see it, right? So whenever you're developing these applications, you got to go through that. You got to create a, a route, and then you got to create your controller, and then you got to create your view, you got to create your model, and it gets super repetitive. So Rails is awesome for automating repetitive tasks. And one of the things that they do is they provide this command line, um, uh, command, line command that uh, allows you to automatically do all of that. So you can tell that Rails, I've got Rails G scaffold here, but G is just an, um, uh, a command which is actually generate. So it's Rails generate scaffold. And then the user is actually the what I'm generating. So I'm going to generate this, this concept of a user on the site. So I'm going to have a user's table. I'm going to have a user controller. And then for each user, I'm going to collect their birthday, their phone, their gender, their SIN, their name. And so Rails does all that, wraps it all up. And if you're not entirely familiar with Rails, what it'll end up creating for you is this controller, which we just talked about. And you'll see here that in it, it's telling you it's going to give you get slash users as a URL, but it's also going to respond to get users dot JSON. So really, it's going to give you an API. So when you're developing this, if you're not conscious about that, you'll have that, and then you'll go into your view. And so this is what the generated HTML looks like. And I hope you can see my mouse because I'm moving it all around, I guess, kind of obnoxiously. But here, if a user is going to view this user's information or a, a subsequent user, I don't want them to see the, you know, the sin and the gender, let's say. We're going to keep that private. So where I've got gender and I've got sin, I'm now going to go ahead. Thanks for confirming you see it. Um, and I'm going to remove those. So they're not in the view anymore. So when you actually go to this page slash user one, you're not going to see that information. And so that's awesome. However, because you've gone ahead and you've created this API endpoint automatically through the scaffold, if you ping users.json, it's going to render those two pieces of information. And so if you were not consciously as a developer developing your API, you might not realize you have to edit the second file to remove that information. So this is what was actually generated when you run the scaffold. And so we had that view that actually shows the information, but then there's this JSON file. And so it just so happened I was using JBuilder for the example. Um, and that's why this is, this is rendered here. And so 
you'll see JSON extract, right? And you're telling it the exact parameters that you want to render when you're going to the JSON endpoint. So if you don't update that file and remove gender and sin, your HTML file is going to be fine. But when you ping .json, it's not going to be fine. You're going to disclose that. So from a development perspective, that kind of explains um, the beginning where we're talking about automation. But in terms of the code abstraction, if you're developing and you're building your application, and today you have five parameters you're going to render, tomorrow you have 10, and then the next day you have 15, they're continually being added to for this model based on the type of information or your, your changing functionality. It's going to get super annoying to have to keep going back through this process all the time. And so are you going to do it all by hand? The answer is, of course, no, you're not because you're a developer and you want to save your time. So rather than have JSON extract and all the parameters where you're going to list out, you know, your 15, 20 or whatever, you're just going to use the handy method merge. And you're going to say, give me all the attributes that's on the user. So rather than have everything, you now have this nice, short, maintainable piece of code. They both provide you the exact same thing, right? You see everything that's there. So that's awesome if you kind of know what's going on and you want to render everything, you don't have a problem. But tomorrow, if you decide to, to add a sensitive parameter to it, let's say a secret password, you're fine using the first because you haven't actually consciously added that, right? This code hasn't changed once you go ahead and you add this column, user's password, and then you update your HTML, you're still fine. You saved yourself because you haven't updated your JSON. However, if you've gone ahead and used JSON merge when your model was originally benign, it had no sensitive information, and then two years down the, uh, down the line, you add a sensitive parameter, JSON merge is gonna bite you in the ass because you're gonna add this parameter for password, you're gonna update your view, you're gonna forget that you've used JSON merge, and now when you ping that URL, you're gonna see the new parameter that's down there, despite the fact that you didn't update that field, or rather that file. So those are the reasons why this happens. The last one you'll see here where I've automated the task uh, out of stupidity is a personal anecdote from my own. So when I was a developer, um, I was working with a mobile team and uh, I had no concept of security at the time. And so the mobile team kept coming back to me and saying, hey, we need some more information provided out of the API. And so I said, you know what? I'm just gonna give you the full object because you're getting annoying. I don't wanna keep updating my code and you're developing a mobile application. Who's ever gonna see the traffic out of the mobile application? So that's another reason why stupidity comes in, right? We all know we can proxy the mobile app. There's all the information because I've returned a full object out of every field. So that takes us to how do we find it? Really, this, is, this has been covered off by pretty much everyone that's talked, right? Um, Jason Haddock's talked about it right away when you identify software used, right? Going back to how to shop web once, or web one, Wappalizer is my go-to. Uh, I love it. I will always look for Rails, Angular, and React. Um, Rails and Angular, particularly because I understand the Rails development pattern um, so it's real easy to start finding things and, and think through the logic that people are using because I, I've played with it before, right? So I encourage you as a hacker, one of the things I think that's super fundamental and helpful is to go out and think of something that you want to build, take a weekend and build it in Rails or build it in Django or try to actually develop that. And then you'll see the struggles that developers go through or even just pick up a book and understand their thought process, design patterns, and where things can go wrong. Um, you'll find a lot of documentation around that in terms of like security considerations uh, for different frameworks, tools, all kinds of stuff. The, the other reason why I look for Angular, and I'm not gonna really touch upon it, but is Angular injections are so common. So start throwing around those, what was it, the mustache curls or what, whatever they're referred to as, uh, with seven times seven and look for 49. I do that. and. So many applications are vulnerable to that. Um, the reason why I list React there is because, uh, and Angular, the reason why they're included here is because um, they will use that API um, design pattern, right? Like they'll use the API and then they'll use the information out of what's being returned in JSON to render on site. So you might not see it on site, but that information is going to be there. Uh, if a developer screws up. So with React, I've seen that's where people will kind of render in the page uh, just because of the way that it's designed and developed. 
Um, whereas Angular, that's where you'll see actual API calls if you're monitoring your traffic. The rail sites, uh, that's kind of what I was talking about in terms of the design pattern. Um, you'll always have this kind of slash model slash ID um, in a URL. So that's kind of a giveaway when you're working with rails. Uh, it's not, you know, hundred percent, but you might see slash users slash one um, or, you know, slash users slash bookmarks slash one type thing. And then it gives you an idea that you're, you're working with rails. Also watch the burp proxy history, right? Like it's super easy to start looking through the HTML that's there um, and watch for those JSON included uh, blobs that are there. It's, it's crazy. Um, the sites that I've come on to or join private programs that have had hackers there for a couple months and nobody's looked at this because there's so much HTML that's returned and it's returned at the bottom. Uh, I can only assume that's why. Uh, so that's been, uh, been successful for me. And the cool thing about that too is it's a design pattern, right? So if you're seeing it on one URL, chances are it's going to be at others. So you've got to go through everywhere. And what differentiates that between say a site that, you know, site-wide has a CSRF problem is that these are unique endpoints, right? Like there is no single fix for that. The application owners have to go through everything and find out where they've done this to fix it. So they're unique bounties for you. Um, there's really, it's, I, I've never had a site argue with me about that because it's they're separate issues, right? Like you can't go and fix that right away, arguably. And, you know, knowing my luck tomorrow, someone will say that they can. Um, in terms of the, uh, the burp history, again, watch for the API calls. You'll see in the examples where um, API calls end up returning a full object as opposed to, you know, just the fields that they need. Um, and developers won't realize that you can see that potentially, uh, or rather their QA team, because they're not necessarily looking at the API calls. They might just be looking and using the website itself. So they don't realize the information is there or how it can be chained together. Lastly, mobile apps provide you great insight into, uh, into APIs, which people think like myself when I was naive, uh, a naive developer, don't think people are going to see. And so as a result, um, you can see all the information that's there and, you know, that'll be, uh, usually, um, there will be a lot of uh, eye doors there, information disclosures, uh, and other fun bugs to play with. So uh, in a nutshell, you're going to want to look for that private user information, broader account information, uh, admin info, uh, but something that can actually be used to attack the application and then demonstrate what the issue is. So in terms of my examples, um, first and foremost here, this was one that kind of, um, it frustrated me when I got this response, um, but at the same time, it was a huge learning opportunity, um, something that I took away. So I found um, an endpoint where you could go to, you know, slash, I think it was slash customer, an unguessable user ID. And then whatever you went to after that, whatever endpoint existed, you had access to, despite the fact you didn't have permissions to it. And so because I had that, I reported it as a vulnerability. Yes, you had to have this unique this user ID, but at the same point, everything after that was disclosed when I didn't have permission to see it. So they closed it on me and they said, no, this isn't a vulnerability because you'll never be able to guess that customer ID. So I told them I'll be back. Sure enough, spent day, two days, and it just turned out um, if you had access to um, the order for a user, you didn't have access to customer info, um, they ended up giving you this customer ID. And so that was the unique user ID that I was looking for. And so it just happened to be that they were an Angular application. They were returning this in the API, but they weren't actually using the information. So when you saw it in burp history, there's your 26 character UUID, pop that into the URL, go to billing info. And then all of a sudden I have all kinds of crazy information about the customer that I'm not supposed to have. Sure enough, we agree this is a vulnerability. Here's your four figure payout, which probably could have been avoided if they validated the first one and given me a three figure payout. So, um, that's a key takeaway for me is that you got to dig a little bit deeper and you'll get paid a little bit more. In terms of the private address info, um, here, this, um, this target identified that, you know, you're going to, you're going to suggest a contract to another user, but that user will never see your address until they actually accept the contract. So again, red flag for me, your address will never be shared with until some point. So can I find the address before I hit the until? Sure enough, I can. Um, sorry for the crazy amount of red here, but I wanted to use this to demonstrate, this is all HTML. Like this is all the HTML uh, blurb that's there. So it's all encoded text. But if you actually look at it, 
Um, and I, yeah, here's the actual um, size of the HTML. Like this is massive. So you had to scroll way down inside of this blurb that had a whole bunch of crap in it. But then you can actually see here's the actual address. And this happens on the create endpoint, not the accepted uh, endpoint. So they're disclosing the information well before they're supposed to be. Um, let them know and yeah, they agree. And there's another four figure payout. My last example here, um, and this was the best one that I've ever found. Um, again, same idea. And the reason why, um, unfortunately, I, I can't show you the HTML is because I didn't record it um, because I was sitting there and I was scratching my head. I couldn't understand how I found this. I just grabbed all the information, decoded it and provided it to the company. But you'll see here, uh, birth date was something they said they would never ever share. I could find out when a user's account was created, um, their email confirmation code. I wasn't sure what I could actually do with that, but it was listed. Um, their Facebook identifier, their internal IP, phone ID, password hash, um, how they received their payments. Um, I don't know what the refund token was, but sounds kind of interesting. Uh, their roles on the site. Um, and so they actually have administrators and employees that have um, profiles. So I assume that there would have been something juicy there for us to at least target. Uh, and then the salt for the password. So that would help me trying to decrypt kind of what they're doing. Um, again, this was a, a high figure, uh, uh, high four figure payout. Um, and you'll see here that they said they it resolved it quickly just because of the severity of it. Um, and this was awesome. This was a, this was a great payday right before Christmas. Um, so that's it. Um, I, I saved some time because I was hoping there might be some questions to, to kind of go of uh, or go over. Um, obviously I've got my shameless plug here for web hacking 101. Um, and then obviously check out shopify.com slash careers because the place to work is honestly amazing. I can have realized it before I joined them. And yes, I absolutely love ketchup chips. I feel like everyone in this presentation would love ketchup chips as well if they tasted them, um, especially uh, Smiggles. Dude, great presentation. Thanks so much, man. No worries. I'm glad to have, uh, to have had the opportunity. Thanks very much. Um, let's see, uh, where are we at in the schedule right now? It is 1.23 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, a couple minutes for questions, literally two minutes. Anybody have any questions? Uh, let me look in the thing. No, it looks like we're good, Pete. Thanks so much for, uh, for coming on. All right, awesome. I got to figure out how to give you back uh, control over everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Peter. It's uh, you've got a lot of fans right now in the in the chat. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everyone, and uh, yeah, I'll hand over control as soon as I figure out what I'm doing here, Sam. <laughs> thanks again. No worries. Thank you. <laughs>